far too often, God, we, we desire, we want to look, we want to look wise in the eyes of the world. We have not spoken truth with our hearts. We've said and done hurtful things to our friends and our family. We have forgotten our true identity, wandering into ways that are not yours. We've lost the path of true worship, focusing on form and words rather than lives. We've forgotten what true discipleship is. And because of this, you have a quarrel with us. Forgive us and help us live into becoming the people you have created and called us to be. People of justice and love and truth and humility and, yes, even foolishness. May we be fools for Christ, embracing our true identity, even in the face of the world's scorn and derision. Please help us to open our ears, open our hearts, and open our lives to your words today. In your name we pray. Amen. So, far too often, far too often. So I really wish Charlie was here today, because this is an opening I really wanted Charlie to be here for. Because the question is, do you all remember the first concert you went to? I'm embarrassed to say my first, co my first concert was at the Post Pavilion, and it was uh, Whitney Houston. And I'll never forget that concert. Charlie could tell us probably, he probably saw like Led Zeppelin or Queen or somebody like that live for the first time. But y'all, who here remembers their first concert? Corn, anybody seen Corn? No? Do y'all know who Corn is? Tim's back there shaking his head. No. So now just think back to all those concerts from, from years ago, back in the 70s, and how easy it was to, to imagine large gatherings at stadiums and theaters and, and even those Billy Graham crusades, you know, preachers and spiritual teachers easily filling aquar um, auditoriums. But it was back then. Could you imagine now walking for a day, walking miles upon miles upon miles on foot? Again, how else are you going to walk? But on foot, in sandals or slides, hungry, thirsty. You got the elements to deal with. Maybe there's even danger on the road. And just to, uh, just to hear some obscure rabbi from Nazareth. Now, we do know that Jesus was not just an obscure teacher selling the latest and greatest answer to everything. We know, uh, we, we know a hack when we see one. But when Jesus spoke, E.F. Hutton, when Jesus spoke, you listened. Because he spoke with divine authority. He was an, an author of the law and not just an interpreter. So Jesus saw the crowds gathering and and he went up on a mountainside, and there he sat down, he began to teach. Maybe the last time the Jewish people gathered in such a large crowd was uh, some teachings from the Lord was at, was at Sinai. Similar, they listened in trembling reverence to the words and the instructions of God for their very lives at that one. That was also when God gave the Ten Commandments to, to the children of, of Israel. This time, however, the Sermon on the Mount, instead of with fire and smoke, God visited his people in, in the form of a man. He sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to dwell with us in human flesh. And Jesus also experienced hunger, thirst, bitterness, and suffering just as we do. Jesus' words evoked the same reverence in those listening and in us today. As we listen to his words over 2,000 years later, in Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus expands upon the Torah. It's not only, you know, following of, of the instruction, but, but following the words and intentions of the scripture with your very heart. It's fulfilling the spirit of the law as, as well as the letter of the law. Jesus raised the bar. He raises the standard of the law. 
The first part, and we talked about that word Beatitudes. And on the Mount of Beatitudes, Jesus pointed out our weaknesses. He showed us that we are not able to keep the Torah in our own will, our own strength. That we rely on him to follow the Torah in the spirit by walking with him. See, the end goal is not to follow a command for the sake of, of keeping the commandments. It's to follow the command out of love, out of obedience to the one who instructs us. And I want to look at the beginning of this. Let's look at, um, we're going to look at Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Apparently I have spilled coffee in this Bible at one point. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. So here's some of those values we talked about in the children's message. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. When he saw the crowds, he went up to the side of a mountain and sat down. Jesus' disciples gathered around him and he taught them. God blesses those people who depend only on him. They belong to the kingdom of heaven. God blesses those people who grieve. They will find comfort. God blesses those people who are humble. The earth will belong to them. God blesses those people who want to obey him more than to eat or drink. They will be given what they want. God blesses those people who are merciful. They will be treated with mercy. God blesses those people whose hearts are pure. They will see him. God blesses those people who, who make peace. They will be called his children. God blesses those people who are treated badly for doing right. They belong to the kingdom of heaven. God blesses, God will bless you when people insult you, when they mistreat you, and tell all kinds of evil lies about you because of me. Be happy and excited. You will have a great reward in heaven. People did these things to the, to the prophets who lived long ago, such as the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen, amen. That's a lot to, to, to live up to, isn't it? But there you have a description of what every Christian is meant to be. It's not just the, the description of some sort of exceptional Christian. Jesus does not say here that certain outstanding characteristics are going to be rewarded. It's a picture of every believer in Christ. Jesus says that this is the only kind of person who is truly blessed, truly happy. Someone suggested once that it can be put like this. This is the sort of person who is to be congratulated. This is the sort of person to be envied, for he alone is truly happy. And happiness or blessing is, is the kind of question that is confronting everybody around us today. The whole world is, is longing for happiness. A lot of times we say it, it's just do what makes you happy. And sadly, we see it repeated over and over again. Many ended up in, in more misery than when they started out. Jesus gives us the principles and the beatitude gives us the principles in finding fulfillment and happiness in this world. And if you really want to be happy, then here is the way. The first thing we need to know is that, one, all Christians, all of us, each one of us are to be like this. This is not for a selected few. This is not the standard for pastors and then everybody else gets free will. No. Jesus meant it for all. It's a description of what every one of us can be, is meant to be. You can be blessed whether you are a, a full-time Christian pastor or just an ordinary believer, if this is even just your first time stepping into a church. Man tends to have such a distinction between, between a, a, a pastor and, and just ordinary Christians. I'm a sinner just like y'all. Because they are, they are a pastor full-time or doing more of God's work, they are better, blessed, 
or they enjoy a certain degree of blessing others do not have? No. From the scriptures, we can see there is no such distinction. We are all called to be saints and to be blessed in this way. The Beatitudes, they are a description of a character, not an office, not a talent. The Bible talks about different offices, you know, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and they, they help the church. The Bible also talks about spiritual gifts so that, so that members can build up the church. And we need, desperately need everybody's gifts because we are all one body. But this has nothing to do with blessing. God blesses a character, not an office, not a title, not a particular gifting. He blesses a character. We're all called to exemplify everything that is contained here in the Beatitudes. And number two, you can't have two, you can't have one without having a two. So number two, Jesus expects us to, to manifest, to live out all of these characteristics. It's not a pick which one you like. We'd like to do that, but it's not a pick which one do you like and be like that, and you'll be blessed. That's not the way it works. Apparently, this is a, a composite picture of what a Christian can be and what a Christian ought to be. It's not right to say some are meant to be poor in spirit, some are meant to mourn, and some are meant to be peacemakers, and so on, so forth. It's like the fruit of the Spirit that's mentioned in Galatians 5.22. It is one fruit. You are able to, to manifest, to live out all nine aspects of, of the fruit. And although we may manifest one aspect more than others from time to time, we can't split them up as if we can be contented to, to have love, but not self-control. To have joy, but not kindness. God expects us to become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, to be fully Christ-like in every aspect of our lives. In other words, this is achievable. We have to believe that we can. Similarly, here in the Beatitudes, one aspect may be more prominent than the others, but we need to grow in all of them. In fact, it seems that these qualities are, they are interlinked. We cannot have one without the others. You cannot truly mourn without hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You can't do that without being one who is meek and a peacemaker. So we can, we can look at the Beatitudes at, as a complete whole. Just like the fruit of the Spirit. Don't divide them. Grow in all of them. And number three, none of these descriptions are what we may call natural human tendency. These aren't moral pursuits. In fact, these qualities aren't in worldly terms. Hence, there's the homework for the kids for tomorrow, for next week. The list here is not a reference to some personality traits or some good temperaments that we can, we can cultivate. This is not a moral education class that Jesus is advocating, hoping to change some of us into good moral beings. These are spiritual qualities. They are not learned abilities. No man naturally conforms to the descriptions here given in the Beatitudes. Jesus is not describing for us some, some natural qualities or some natural temperaments, like, like some people being more meek than others. They're characteristics that can be made possible in each of our lives because of God. And it is by God's grace that we can grow to be like this. It also means it is possible for all of us to, for all of us to display each of these characteristics regardless of our personalities or our temperaments or our level of sarcasm or our degree of bad jokes. And finally, we see it number four. The Beatitudes set a different benchmark from the world. There's a clear difference between the way a Christian 
and a non-Christian live their lives. And take a quick look at the, at the list. The expressions, poor in spirit, mourn, meek, merciful. They seem to be more of a description of what the world would call a weakling. The world seeks for, for a, a person of strength or, or confidence, a person in charge, and a fighter. Billy Graham says that the world will say it is this way, happy are the clever, for they shall inherit the admiration of their friends. Happy are the aggressive, for they shall inherit property. Happy are the talented, for they shall inherit a career. Happy are the rich, for they shall inherit a world of friends and a house full of modern gadgets. This is the kind of person that the world admires. Yet the Beatitudes, they, they paint a, a contrasting picture. Blessed are those who, who are hunger and who thirst for righteousness, not wealth, not money, not status, not position, not popularity. Blessed has nothing to do with knowledge, wealth, health, status, or fame. And I realize you can see the measure of a true Christian by the things that that person is seeking, the things that that person really, really wants. The non-Christian can only live for this world. He says, this is the only world. I'm going to get out of it all I can. The Christian starts by saying, I'm not living for this world. His whole outlook, his whole ambition is different. It's clear that we are called to be different from the rest. We are called to act and behave in a different way. And this is how Peter describes us in, in 1 Peter 2. In 1 Peter 2, 9 and 11. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And then in 11, he goes, friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from sinful desires. You see, the distinction between a Christian and a non-Christian must be maintained. We can't blur the line. We can't make the world and the church looking alike. They're not going to. Notice the first beatitude and the last beatitude promise the same reward. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus starts and ends with this because it's his way of saying that the first thing you have to realize about yourself is that you belong to a different kingdom. You belong to a different king. The Bible makes it clear that we are living in two absolutely different worlds. Yes, you are in this world, but no, you are not of this world. Our conduct is paramount in reaching out to the world for Christ. John 17, 20 to 23, he says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray, for all, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given, in 22, he goes on to say, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. See, Jesus, he used the phrase, that the world may believe that you have sent me. He used that phrase twice. Our conduct, specifically our love for one another. And I don't mean in words. I mean in what, how we live, how we treat each other, how we, how we show grace and how we forgive and how we love. It's going to cause the world to see Christ. And earlier in John, John 13, 35, Jesus said, By this... All men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. 
actions speak louder than we could ever imagine. And I remember the story that a minister was being shown through a large weaving mill where one of his, one of his congregation worked. Mentioning that, that particular employee to a foreman, the pastor said, I suppose that, I suppose that, that Jimmy is one of your best workers. Foreman responded, no, sorry to say he isn't. The trouble with Jimmy is that he stands around talking about his religion when he ought to be attending to his, to his work. He's a good enough fellow and has a making of, of a fine weaver, but he hasn't learned yet that while he's on the job, his religion ought to come out of his fingers and not out of his mouth. It's a wise observation. During working hours, that employee's testimony should have come from the honest labor of his hands. A familiar, if y'all remember this, maybe nobody under my age will remember this, the Yellow Pages slogan that said, let your fingers do the walking. For the Christian who wants to point others to Christ, however, there are occasions when it's best to let your fingers do the talking. So here we see the eight qualities together that define the life of the citizen of God's kingdom. We are to grow and live, all of them, not by our own, but by the grace of God through the Holy Spirit. We are to live differently from the world. The distinction must remain clear cut. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, are we living out these kingdom qualities in our in our daily life, we must make the ambition, we must make the ambition to do so because this is what we are meant to be. Let's bow our heads. God has called us and blesses us when we live God's ways and not the world's. God's love embraces us, embraces you, even when we fall short of what God desires for your life. Know that God of, know that the God of blessing loves and forgives you with a fierce tenderness. And in so knowing, may your life and your soul be transformed. Amen.